and I welcome you to the very first Beautiful Brian podcast. Um, I Many of you are probably wondering why I decided to embark on this venture. Uh, basically, because Beautiful Brian's Corner, uh, which was a home-based video or cam video of myself um, you know brushing people up on the day's events or the week's events on competitive eating and and then just putting together a bunch of videos with it and editing and splicing and I was doing this basically all on my own and it was very popular um, I did 26 shows, lasted, i said about three years, and I had studio guests, and I had phoning guests. The majority of the show was basically phone guests, and it was, it was fun. I mean, I, I look forward to it because I was putting something out that a lot of people in competitive eating wanted to see. It was groundbreaking, it was innovative, it was, but it was a pain in the ass. Um, and with a podcast, I could be practically naked, and I could put together a show, and it's, it's a lot easier, it's a lot more relaxing, it's, I'm very, you get to see a side of me that's very laid back which is really most of the time. And I could basically say whatever I want. I could, you know, I'll have some phone guests. I'll have interviews. Um, and I'll ramble on and on and on. And I don't give a fuck if the haters out there say, oh, psyching is boring, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm fall. You can't fall asleep on a radio show. You might fall asleep at the computer screen watching someone speak countless hours and hours, whatever. But if you could tune into Howard Stern for five hours a day, and trust me, most of the time he has absolutely nothing. It's almost like, you know, you're eavesdropping on someone's bar conversation or, you know, who they hung out with during the week. That's what his show is all about. But he does have a knack of keeping his audience glued to the radio. The ones that subscribe to it. I think he made a big mistake by um, going with Sirius and banning terrestrial radio. Um, that was a huge mistake because even though, you know, a lot of people... You know, he's a multimillionaire anyway, so... It doesn't matter how many subscribers Sirius gets to listen to this guy. But I think, you know, radio was always a free based thing. Um, and, you know, anything in, in regard to the Internet or, you know, media television, radio, whatever, it should be free. There's no reason we anyone should have to pay for this. So it's all big business. Uh, back in the 60s, we weren't paying for t to watch 12 hours a day of TV, a television, you know. Um, it went off the air at midnight, and then we woke up at 6 in the morning and, you know, watched, uh, watched Gumby and David and Goliath, for those of you that are old, 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 old school. And, you know, you look forward to that, um, that, you know, that, that test signal going on at midnight and shutting everything down. Now everything's 24 hours, but it's been like that for a long time. So but anyway, I'm straying off the, basically the topic itself. Um, I just feel that people will listen a lot more than they're going to watch. So, 
if you're at your job and you got your headset on and you know you want to kill five six hours or whatever or kill an hour then you'll tune me in and you'll hear what I have to say I think it's I probably should have done this a long time ago years ago um, so Ron Koch is gonna be my first guest today um, there might be times I don't have any guests or I might not take any phone calls or whatever but um He has a lot of things he wants to get off his chest, and um, I think this podcast is probably the best way to do it. Um, so anyway, yesterday I was at the um, the war at the shore uh, at in um, Salisbury, Maryland, and I had a blast. It was just any time, you know what? I don't think I could ever say that I have competed in a major league eating event and I was bored to my and I was bored out of my mind or I didn't want to be there. It just it's you know it's it's such a refreshment from the grind the 40 hour grind you put in at work 40 hour a week. I mean, you know, it's it's like it's like night and day, man. And the people there, they're like so friendly and the sponsor was like real cool and um, there's a few oddballs that I just choose not to associate with anymore. But, you know, that's like, it's like that everywhere you go, man, you know, either at work or in people are people and you're not going to get a perfect world, so... You want to try to be friendly to someone, and they just like, you know, basically give you the cold shoulder and do you a favor by shaking your hand or whatever, and then move on to, you know, a, a higher ranked competitor. Move on to, you know, having a uh, a conversation with a higher ranked competitive eater than whatever. I, I was never in competitive eating to make friends. Associations, yes. But like one unnamed, one unnamed person that I won't mention his name because this guy will probably fly off the hook if I quote him. But he once said to me that uh, Major League Eaters, they're, you know, these guys, they're really not the kind of guys you want to sit down and have dinner with or you know, socialize with. Well, he's right and he's wrong. There are some that I wouldn't mind sitting down and, and socialize with. I've actually made two or three real good friends out of the um, out of this organization, and one of them is uh, still competing right now, and we'll probably be friends till you know till till freaking death do us part, whatever. So. But I got a chance to meet some uh, new faces. I met uh, Mickey Sudo. Uh, she's a lovely girl, pretty. Uh, she's very intense, uh, and she all she basically wants to do is compete, win, uh, you know, make a name for herself, and hopefully make a lot of money. She's made some. She's picked up some pretty good cash lately, so. Uh, it was really nice meeting her. Um, Michelle Lesko, who I just cannot say enough about. This is a young lady that, you know, you could probably be the most uninteresting person in the world, and she'll probably sit down and still st have a lengthy conversation with you about any topic. It doesn't have to be competitive eating. It could be anything. This is all about upbringing. If you're brought up right, and my mother used to tell me this, if you're brought up to be a mensch, you will go through life being a mensch. Um, you know, this, 
This has to start when you're like two, three years old, man. I mean, you you got to be bred to like people, to to want to communicate with people. Um, and it's also, it's all about the friends you uh, associate with and um, the people that you're involved with. That plays a huge part as well. There was a time when, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they talk behind my back. Oh, this guy only goes to, um, he shows up contest all by himself, you know. Um, there was a time in my life where I cannot, I could not go anywhere without a companion. And it doesn't have to be a female companion. I'm talking about female, male, whatever. I was very insecure. And, you know, if I, if I was, to go buy something or uh, not the supermarket but like you know Walmart or whatever I don't think they even had Walmart then just gotta go to Sears or a department store I always had to have a friend with me and that stopped that ceased to play a part in my life as years progressed and it's been a while only because I, there was one time I think I asked someone if they wanted to go somewhere. I think it was bowling or to a club or whatever. And I was already raring to go. And, oh, I, I can't make it tonight or something like that. And for some reason, I made a commitment to myself that if I'm going to do something and I want to get it done, I'm not depending on anyone. Um... And this is not a knock on the on females or the female gender, but sometimes it takes forever for a woman to get ready. When you ask them, they have to be at a certain place at a certain time, and you're ready and raring to go, and they're still putting their makeup on or their high heels like they're going to a wedding or something. I just gave up with that shit, you know. <laughs> so, um, but this this contest itself was very, very interesting. It, you know, I've been in hundreds of major league eating events going back to what, 1997. And then when the IFOC first got started, got their feet wet back in 2001, um, that's when it started to catch on. And George Shea brought me up on the stage uh, prior to the event. And I'm telling you, I, if, like, Ed Crotchy once said to me, um, this was a while back, if he wanted someone to promote a product or something that he's endorsing, George Shea would be the guy that he would go to. And I would have to agree 100%. I mean, this guy is totally on the ball. He knows exactly what to say, how to keep the crowd entertained. Um, I always said that George Shea is to competitive eating what Brian Epstein was to the Beatles. Um, he was the key in making this sport what it is today. And you got all these copycat organizations that, and, and where are they now, okay? I mean, you got one that's still hanging by the threads, one contest a year, while the IFOC is still going, is still gangbusters. They're going strong, man, so. And we were talking about, you know, the old days and, you know, you just, and it was just, it, it really gave me goosebumps because the, the crowd was really into this. And um, and for like, when everything was over and all the smoke cleared and then I went home, I'll just fast forward a little bit. I'm getting in my car and a bunch of uh, young ladies, I'll give them the respect. I want to call them groupies. They were just nice kids. Uh he said, oh, can we have your autograph and can we take a picture with you? You know you know how that made me feel? It made me feel like a million bucks. Because, you know, I've, 
I've been through this before. It's not something new, but there's been a long stretch between that. And um, I was just really, um, that made me really happy, you know, um, feeling like feeling like Justin Bieber for about three minutes. And it gives you a euphoric feeling that you've never felt before. Absolutely incredible. So I was really happy about that. Um, but the contest itself, um, you know, I'm like, I'm at the point where I know I'm going to, I know I'm not going to do well, but I just don't want to finish last. And unfortunately, when they weighed the remains, there we go again. Beautiful Brian right there in the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it is. You got to take the good with the bad. And I'm competing next to Crazy Legs Conti. And Crazy Legs is like a legend in himself. I mean... I don't know what to say about that guy. You know, I honestly, man, and th this is the God's honest truth. I really like that guy. I mean, he has done a lot for me. Um, we put together videos. Um, you know, we did a lot in the past. Um, and, you know, we've dined out a few times. Um. I think he knows I'm not a big drinker, so sometimes I sort of tend to s stay away from the bar scene, um, only because sometimes people drink a little too much and then they start getting obnoxious, and it's like, you know, you only see a side of them after they had two drinks, and, you know, where's their real side before they hit the bottle or, you know, got in there, so. <clears throat> so anyway... When I said I really want to like him, it's like, maybe it's like a, there's a hint of jealousy there of some sort, because like, for every time that I want to like him, it's like something just draw, draws me back into not like him afterwards, and <laughs> I'm not going to go into a long thing about this. Maybe it's because of the media attention he gets. Um, when I probably think I'm just as good, but then a lot of people think I'm not just as good. Um, he's uh, very well versed. He knows how to speak to people. Uh, he doesn't dress very well, but I guess that's his. That's that's part of his like shtick. Um, but. Uh, he has a much stronger command of the English language than I do. And I admire him for that. You know, there's nothing will sink you worse uh, than not having a good command of the English language or not being able to express yourself properly. It'll sink you almost as bad as bad breath. Uh, it's, that's how it is. And unfortunately, I've heard a lot of those characters on the radio and I wonder how they have radio shows and stuff like that and the majority of them are on these listener sponsor stations specifically one in particular is WBAI in New York which is I think is a great station but some of the people that are on there are not very well educated but then again you have to remember that they're not getting paid for their time um, they're doing this for nothing uh, just the thrill of being on the radio. And I could do the same thing. You know, I could get on the radio and I could give you a two-hour show and take phone calls and people are going to probably love what I have to say even if I have nothing to say. Because I know how to keep an audience entertained. There are some that will say I'm boring. I'm no, no, that's not the case at all, man. And it's reflective on all the hits that I received when I did my show, when I did Beautiful Brian's Corner. A lot of people enjoyed it. 
and there wouldn't be five six hundred remember this was all before the YouTube craze YouTube didn't even get their feet wet till what to late 2006 2007 by that time beautiful Bryant's corner was on its way out so you can just imagine if all of my highly rated shows were on YouTube wow but there are some that just don't know how to speak to people and the only way that they could get attention or their notoriety is to do something stupid uh, trying to kill themselves or hurt themselves you know eating chalk crayons um, you know drinking apple cider vinegar straight up I mean you know these are the things that'll, that will that can get you hurt when you hit a certain age but you know they these these morons today they're not stupid they're young and they know that they could get away with it if they were 50 years old they wouldn't be doing this so keep that in mind but anyway again I'm straying off the topic which is not good let's I want to get back to crazy legs Conti I know he had some issues with his corn title and when I saw him I said congratulations and uh, he he didn't like that very much. I could tell he turned his head and he was still upset about it. It was still fresh in his mind, the confrontation he had with Bob Shout. And, you know, one thing about Bob Shout, he's a, he's a real class act. He doesn't want to get into naming or finger pointing. And, you know, I was texting him and I really couldn't get anything out of him. And I think he knew what I was driving at. But he's not the kind of guy that's going to come back on the text and say, oh, that fucking Conti, that son of a bitch. He didn't deserve that title. I, I threw it, I, I, I even proved it to him. I, I showed him up by, you know, giving him that, showing him that piece of corn, whatever. Um, oh, he doesn't get into that. Um, he also stressed that he doesn't let anyone control his happiness. And that's... Unfortunately, a lot of people should adhere to that policy. But what I notice is that Crazy Legs was competing next to me at the contest. And he was separating his flats from his drumsticks. And those are the two essential, those are two essential pieces uh, in... Um, of chicken wings when you buy chicken wings you either have flats or the drumsticks um, there might be two others I'm not sure but I was wondering why he was doing that and it's obvious that the flats are easier to eat than the drumsticks but I also noticed he wasn't cleaning his wings and if you don't clean your wings, you're going to have some problems. So he was taking like a few bites and then throwing them back into the tray. <clears throat> now, mind you, this was a 20-pound tray. And I was wondering if I should do the same. I, I really know because I wasn't you – know, I've competed in chicken wing contests, but only ones, only the ones out in Buffalo. So this was – these wings were a lot meatier, a lot bigger. And – very dry. I mean, this is not a knock against the sponsor. The, sp the sponsor was beautiful. But any time food is left out, it doesn't matter how, how good the food is or the quality of the food. If the food is left out for a long period of time, sit out in either the sun or the cold or whatever, it's going to affect the quality of of the food itself so most competitive eaters they fast um, and they drink a lot of water so it doesn't matter how shitty the food tastes it's gonna be like a welcome relief to them for the first five or six minutes and the brain 
and that's about as much time as the brain tells the food palate or registers and conveys that message to the food palate that this food is starting to taste kind of bad. <clears throat> but by that time, they've consumed most of what they intended to consume, and um, that's why they're major league eaters. Um, I was... We were situated on a elevated platform. Uh, we were the the second tier of eaters were the, I guess, the uh, lower ranked and the higher ranked were on bottom. And I saw Chesna just polishing them off one by one, man. I don't, and Mickey Sudo and, and Sonia and uh, Michelle Lesko. It's just absolutely incredible. They are true champions in my book. And then when we uh, we got to weighing them, and you know what? I'll say one thing about this sponsor um, as compared to other other sponsors. Uh, we had one back in Fairfield Ribs in Connecticut back in 2006. That was a closed-door weighing process. Nobody was allowed in inside the room. <laughs> So they came out and they presented you with your your totals. And back in the day, most of the time, and this was before the Wild Bill era, you didn't even, if you weren't in the top three, you didn't get your tray weight. You were on your own. I mean, either you had to, you had to beg the guys in the back to weigh your tray, or sometimes they wouldn't weigh it at all, so... You had to sort of come up with an approximate amount of what you ate. That's pretty fucked up, man. But now everyone gets their trays weighed. And I have to commend uh, Wild Bill Myers, who I had some differences with in the past. And I shouldn't have had any differences with this man. It was totally my... It was totally on me being an ass, not respecting the guy. When he actually goes out of his way to, and he's not getting anything for this. He's not getting paid for it. To get the final results of every single eater at the table. And I respect him for doing this. I don't think anyone else would do it. I don't think anyone else would care. Especially if you're not a top-ranked eater. But he does this as a as a benefit to most of the people that have complained in the past about not getting a fair shake in the weighing system. And he goes out of his way the same way I go out of my way. To try to enlighten everyone in the competitive eating world about the sport itself. And all I get is shitted on, abused, mocked, ridiculed by just maybe less than a handful of assholes that have no meaning or no sense of direction in their lives or their lives are so miserable that they have to pin the pin the tail on the donkey because I might have said a couple of things about them that really ticked them off but um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the eatfeats.com uh, this is a blog that is run by An anonymous, uh, someone that basically uses a pseudonym by the name of O.J. Rifkin. And I think this individual planned this before he, he or she decided to put this site together. To avoid any confrontations or friction or someone contacting him or... 
I mean, you know, everything about this person is proxy proxy. You can't, you know, you could search the earth and you're probably not going to find out who this individual is. But I mean, if you really wanted to, you wanted to go through law enforcement and other means of directions, you could, you, you could find out who it is, trust me. But this individual has become so popular lately that why would anyone want to do that um you know it's like unmasking clarabelle the clown on howdy doody right <laughs> but anyway there is um and i don't want to go too much into this there's there's two assholes that are not in the ifoc anymore and you know what's funny all of the Anyone that has dropped out of that organization usually dropped out for for selfish reasons. Because they weren't getting enough media attention or they weren't getting making enough money or they weren't able to get what they wanted to get on their own. So what happens is, yeah, they drop out and yeah, they get to do what they wanted to do, you know, and make and, and, and you know and make the money. Sometimes they won't make the money. It's a gamble. Um, competing in non-sanctioned events or whatever. And then when that's over, then they th say to themselves, oh shit, now where do I go? But they'll deny it. They'll, they'll say that, no, I'm, you know, <laughs> one, thing about the, one thing about a narcissist, they will never, ever admit that they made a mistake. So they'll go on all day and night and say that uh, they this was something that they wanted to do, and if they had to do things over, they would they wouldn't change a thing. Right now they're eating themselves up alive, okay? That they can't have the spotlight anymore. Oh, why would I want to be with MLE? What do I need restrictive contracts for? I could do what I want. Yeah, you could do what you want, but who cares? The only one that cares is you. So the next step is to put together YouTube videos so they can get more attention. Um, they can hopefully revive the attention that they've lost not being a part of a professional eating organization like the major leagues. And it might take a year two years, three, nobody will even think about them. They won't, nobody will have any interest in them. They'll just fade away like dust in the wind. And that's it. So. But anyway, there's um, a lot of tension on that website. Um, and there's basically only maybe two or three people that cause that tension or else um, there wouldn't be any. I'm not even going to go into this because all you have to do is go on there and see for yourself what's some of the comments. But there was one comment by that struck me as something that I think really hit home. And um, this was the, uh, the this was by someone who, who posts under help the children. It says, uh, May 9th of this year. It says, I cannot even fathom the depths of stupidity between these adults. Honestly, it is sickening to most normal people, which is why I would never want anyone I respect to come on here and read this drivel. Seventh graders do better because they'll eventually outgrow this moronic behavior. This nonsense, this nonsense is beyond idiocy. And it really makes the entire sport look like a bunch of elementary school children that need serious evaluation. This is a classic case of schoolboys that never really figured it out. Unfortunately, all of their self-esteem issues seem to need a forum here. As far as I could tell, they still think that this is an acceptable form of behavior for adults. Maybe they think it's funny, or God forbid, even normal. 
It might be normal for a Down syndrome child, but they generally are much nicer people in general because they're not going out of their way to prove to their tragically frail ego that they're funny, entertaining, or just plain despicable. Despicable people with nowhere to go. You pick your number. It seems to, if you seem to the need, if you feel the need to disgrace yourselves, your parents, your school, <laughs> junior high school at best from appearances, competitive, sorry for laughing, man, <laughs> competitive eating legends and tradition, most disturbingly, the The proud Jewish culture and history, regardless of any. And the reason I'm laughing is because I'm thinking about these two morons <laughs> that are reading this. And I know they read it. <laughs> What's going through their minds, you know? <laughs> With that dumbfounded look. Now help the children then... Uh, then help the children decide to, decide to post a return rebuttal. And that said, regardless of any, any positive virtues that might have been offered to you, this is how you choose to disgrace yourself and an otherwise promising upbringing. You think you're stringing up for your, yourselves, but only succeeding in perpetrating any number of unpleasant stereotypes for all the world to see. I know this guy is on the money, but he's a horrible fucking, he needs a, a couple of lessons in grammar. I mean, he puts periods where they don't belong, and he has run-on sentences. Oh, forget it, man. Anyway, like, for instance, this succeeding in perpetrating any number of unpleasant stereotypes, and then he puts a period after that, and then he it starts another sentence for all the world to see. Well, obviously, he wasn't an English major. Would you be happy to have this shit transcribed in the Wall Street Journal? Sadly, I'd bet yes, only under the condition that I achieve some oddly twisted notoriety. This is really pathetic on a number of levels that we sincerely wish you could understand. Maybe consider an email barrage, Facebook party, or whatever. Oh, that, sir, that's not going to happen, okay? They don't want to, they want an audience, so they're not going to email me directly. And tell me how they feel. That's not. There's no fun in that. You know, uh, without an audience and without getting other people, you know, hopefully to getting other people and gaining their sympathies to take direct action against me, they're not going to do it. Would you be happy to have this shit transcribed in the Wall Street Journal? Sadly, I'll bet yes. And only under the condition that I achieve some oddly twisted notoriety. <laughs> That's true. This is really pathetic on a number of levels that we sincerely wish you could understand. Oh no, I just said that already. Maybe you should run this by a rabbi, a trusted friend, or some poor child's parent. <laughs> I'm Certain they would not find any of this amusing or entertaining. This is a primary reason that most top eaters look the other way at the occasional contest or give you the most superficial but polite ag acknowledgement. Get a room, girls. None of the rest of us want to be seen speaking with you. We're not terribly scared, just embarrassed. No hard feelings, fella. This is just my sense of humor, but most of us grew out of it a long time ago. Well. <laughs> He's right on the money, man. Let me tell you. Um, I have to agree with everything. But I'll also say this. OJ Rifkin and EatFeats.com will live forever with these, these, these type of comments. Because that's what keeps that site going. The negativity keeps that site alive. That's the life and blood of the website. So anyone that comes on there, like maybe Rich Lefevre, and says, oh, great job, you know, whatever. It's just not, 
gonna cut it. This world lives on negativity, whether it be for humor or just to elevate oneself by putting others down. You know, <laughs> this site's gonna go on forever because as long as a few people keep it in business with their negative comments, I don't see it going anywhere. And, you know, it's, and alongside that, whoever this O.J. Rifkin is, um, he provides a, a list and a bulletin board of events that are going on throughout the, in the competitive eating world. Not only Major League Eating, but everything. Um, it's ironic that I was promoted heavily on this website for at least about a good four years and um, it's because I objected to a few things that I was completely cut off and you know they thought that that would mean the end of beautifulbrian.com but my site will live on forever and if you want the ultimate in competitive eating news stories um, you know I don't get the gossip I used to but I get gossip I'll always have gossip I feel the only way to get real gossip is to be there, and that's why I'm going to try to make it my business to, you know, try to participate in as many events as possible so I can get you good scoops. Um, it's self-evident with my video of the of the wing contest itself. So far, not one person has posted a video of that contest besides myself. And if they do, it's not going to be anything close to what I put out, quality, or what have you. So on that note, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna say good night. Um, there will be a part two, and uh, that will include my good friend Ron Koch, who uh, was a one time a great competitive eater with Major League Eating. Uh, he set a bunch of incredible records, and especially the one I I always looked at was the. Um, the Alka-Seltzer U.S. Open of competitive eating where I think he put away like eight pounds of pasta in f five or six minutes. I mean, this guy was a beast, man. And, you know, he did the deuce in hot dogs. Um, he just loves to eat. And it's unfortunate that, you know, he had to leave the sport. Um, but... I was going to probably talk about that and get into that a little later on. So I um, hope you enjoyed this uh, initial or inaugural edition of Beautiful Brian's, Beautiful Brian's podcast. And uh, I hope to return uh, in a few days with Ron Koch's uh, thoughts and views on competitive eating. Till then... See you soon, and keep on eating, man. Okay, greetings, everyone. I have here as uh, my special phone guest, and it's an honor to have him on this initial podcast, uh, Ron Koch, who was a uh, former Major League Eating great. Uh, and like I said, and uh, what I said before is, Ron was a great eater and probably still is. Uh, he had to retire for he had to retire for personal reasons, um, but I still can I could still never forget some of the great things he did with the IFOC. Ron, a pleasure to have you, man. Hi, Brian. How you doing? Great, great. Hello to all the IFOCers. Yes. Um, you know, Ron, the um, I was talking a little bit before about. The eight pounds of pasta you put away at the uh, Alka-Seltzer U.S. Open of competitive eating, um, and you did that with such ease. Um, I'm sure you remember that, right? Yes, I do. It's probably uh, the greatest time I've had with the IFOC is the Alka-Seltzer U.S. Open. It was just phenomenal. Yeah, I was, I was, um, and you did it with, um, and I, I think you moved on to like the third round because you. 
you easily went through those cheese fries and then um then I think it was the salad and then the pasta or was No, um then I went up against Sonia. Yeah, that now now that's that, that's nothing to be embarrassed about losing to Sonia. Uh Right. Um, she didn't beat me by that much. She may have beaten me maybe by a quarter of a plate by the end of the whole thing. Mm. And I'm very proud of what I achieved. I'm very proud to have had them as friends. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible what a brotherhood uh, the IFO he used to be. Oh, without question. I mean, I just, I miss the old days, Um, but, you know, you can't always bring back the past. You have to move on and... Um, I had actually always thought that a lot of people refer to you as the, uh, the poor man's version of Rich Lefevre. You actually were living in his shoes, but that's not the case at all, right? No, because unlike other people... Or, or excuse me, living, in, uh, living under his shadow, so to speak. Yeah, that was fine. You know, what, what I do for a living, um, not too many people can compete with me. You know, um, I was the NBA lead photographer from 1970 to 1993. Wow, really? Yeah, I don't know how many people could say they've done that. So, 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 Ron, let me ask you. So, those old photos I used to see of Will Chamberlain slamming down on Willis Reed and the '69 playoffs. Those were your photographs, right? Some of them were. Incredible. Some of them were. I didn't, Duran, I didn't even know that. That is, <laughs> that is astounding news. Did you, um, were you, fit, did you actually take any of the photos of the Ali Frazier fights or, um? Yes, I did. Really? Yes. Uh, was it Ali Frazier 1, 2? Well, no, I. I think it was 2. Oh, 2 was, uh, at Madison Square Garden. And yeah. 1 was, a, 1 was, I think that was like, you know, for anyone to get into that fight. You had to either be, I mean, I heard that Frank Sinatra couldn't even get a ticket, and they had to make him the house photographer yeah. f for that first fight in order to get to get a seat. Yeah, it, it's absolutely unbelievable, um, you know, who you had to be and what you had to do mm. to get into these. Um, I mean, you know, the Pope came into Madison Square Garden. We had uh, Kennedy in Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, a lot of stuff happened back then. I don't talk about my past, you know, but this is a good time to. Not too many people know what connections I had. Um, wow. Out here in Las Vegas, um, I'm the house photographer for MGM. Yeah, that, all, that's all amazing. The concerts that come into MGM. Wow, so you get all of the, uh, you get all the photographs of uh, some of the top rock bands like Kiss and Foreigner and... Uh, you too, and all them, huh? Yeah, my closest friends are actually the Eagles. Oh, man. And, um, I went on a West Coast tour with them for a while. And, That's you know, amazing. So I say, you know, it, it, I live in a fantasy land. You know, eating was just a very, very little part of it. It was, it was more or less to, um, take me down a notch or two. Um, because work sometimes gets on you. You need you need a little comic relief. That's what eating was for me. Absolutely. I never was a, a serious eater. Um, I just wonder what I would have been if I would have practiced and would have taken the uh, eating, you know, contest seriously. On a side note, Ron, do you realize? And I, I just want to stray off the topic of competitive eating for just a moment. Um, do you realize how many groupies or chicks that you could have uh, had major relationships and sex with if they knew that you were had any kind of connections with the Eagles or some of the top major rock groups of this past, the last 30 years? <laughs> it's, it's incredible the uh, things that I've been asked. 
Wow. Yeah, it's, it's just incredible, but I'm a one-woman guy, and that's it. That's it. You turn down a lot of, uh, you turn down a lot of, uh, a lot of potential uh, enticing offers, I assume, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I have to bite my tongue sometimes, let me tell you. There you go, man. Um, but anyway, like, everyone wants to know about your relationship with Rich Lefevre. And, um, you know, I'm sure that everyone is aware of what was going on between you and Rich on eatfeeds.com um first i just want to mention that as far as looks i uh, it's like elvis presley and frank sinatra <laughs> you beat him hands down man i thank you so much for that not only that you have more hair than he does <laughs> Unbelievable! That well, that's that's really doing part to heredity and your father, I assume. If if uh, the male counterpart of the family has a lot of hair, usually their son will have a lot as well. Well, this is the first time I ever let it grow that long, and that's only because of requests by some of the rock stars. Really? Oh, I gotta, I gotta, you gotta send me a picture, man. I gotta definitely see you, uh, uh, you know, uh, duked out and uh, looking like. Um, uh, looking like the guy, looking like Bon Jovi now, you know? <laughs> you know, my hair's long. Um, I have to wear leather when I work with certain people. And, you know, it's just incredible. Right. Were you um, ever involved with the, some of the old groups from the Woodstock era, like, you know, uh, like The Doors and um, Black Sabbath and stuff like that? Or was that a little... As a matter of fact, uh, they were just here a few months ago. Okay, did you ever meet Jim Morrison? Okay, well that's close enough, man. Yeah. Great. That's it's really good to hear that um, that uh, you are a uh, a legend in the uh, in the film world and the photography world as well, man. That's great. But anyway, getting back to competitive eating, um, I want you to give your take on the feud between yourself and Rich the Locust Lefevre. How did it begin? Um, how did it evolve, and is there any uh, is there any chance of a uh, I guess I don't know what the word is, but um, a reconciliation? I'll make it easy. Um, yeah. There's no chance that we'll ever be friends. There's no chance um, that anything will ever happen. Um, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to get too much into it. Um, it's just that, um, as, as people have seen on these things, he likes to throw what he does in your face. Oh, yeah. You know, um, he, he puts these charts on uh, who beat who and how many times he's beaten you and, and so on and so forth. To which I say, so what? I mean, I've never beaten Joey Tess in my life, so does, does that mean I'm going to feel bad every time I compete? I compete because I thought I had friends um, in the Federation. Whenever we went out and we ate together, you know, there was a certain amount of camaraderie, especially after the contest. Uh, when we'd go in a hotel, we'd go get a drink or whatever, just sit around and talk. It was, it was absolutely incredible. Um, now, basically, everybody has their own groupie, and they just disappear, and that's it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh... Oh, and, and, you know, uh, it's no more see you next contest. It's no more shaking hands. Um, oh, he's, some of these guys are just total fucking assholes, man. And, um, you know, there's two in particular that I had mentioned uh, uh, in the earlier segment that I just don't... I don't bother associating with it. They don't, they're practically dead to me. So, I just I just walked right by them yesterday, man. I didn't give a fuck. And I think they know it too. And um, what irks me is that if I was making that kind of money in competitive eating, and I'm friendly even now, and I'm not making a dime, I'm actually losing money on each contest that I compete in because of you know the gas tolls or whatever. If I was making money, I would probably. I'd probably give away some of it to some of these people. 
Not that I'm asking for handouts, but yeah. You know. Uh, you know, I understand that, but you know, with, with the money they're making, I mean, it's unbelievable. And I blame the IFOC for this. All right. Mm -hmm. The top ten eaters should have an automatic buy at these contests. Right. Between Athens. Mm -hmm. Because what it is to compete, if you're going to do, um, if you're going to try to compete and go to qualifiers, you know how much money it comes out of your pocket now, especially with the airfares that it is today? Forget about it, man. Yeah, and yet what the IFOCE will do is they'll send one of the top ten down to your city. Right. To make sure that you don't qualify. They want who they want to be there. And that's just the way it is. Even if there's cheating involved. You know, I mean, how many times have you sat at the end of the table and gotten a rubber hot dog? <laughs> yeah, I mean... You know, how many times... Um, and, and, you know, and this, this is the one that really soured me on the IFOC. When there's a certain year, and once again, I won't mention names... Um, that was allowed to eat hot dogs two minutes after the contest was over. That rolled up hot dog residue in gloves. And yet when the uh, MC was confronted after the contest and, and was told about this, he says, the contest already ended. There's nothing we can do about it. Oh, uh, yeah, I think... I to me, that they had the person that they wanted to win... So even if theoretically you won, they still wanted that person to win. It didn't matter to them. Well, I will say this. There is one individual that is still competing now. And probably if you didn't know him as a competitive eater or you just met him, you'd think he's the nicest guy in the world. Oh, yeah. And I still think he is. He is, absolutely. But, you and I both know who we're talking about. But, yeah, but hear me out on this. Um... He takes the sport so serious that he's not the kind of guy that's going to give up a spot in a qualifier, in a, um, in a major event such as Nathan's. And this person is definitely not going to give up a title that he thinks he won fair and square. And I think you could, I think Joe LaRue can vouch for that. Um, the problem is, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just like the guy from the outside looking in. If I was a major player in the organization and it came down to the situation that you just mentioned with the two hot dogs at the end and I was in the running for getting that spot, man, all hell would break loose. Unfortunately, I've never been in that position. Um, and maybe it's, it's, maybe it's for the best that I haven't, because I don't even know how I would react. A lot of these guys are very, very classy. And, uh... You know, the, the person that was eating inside me, um, I can mention his name, anyhow, is Kevin Roth. And, um, both of us were neck and neck until this happened. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, a lot of guys, they want to branch out and do their own thing because they just don't believe in restrictive restrictive contracts and so forth. Uh, you see, I'll, let me just explain one thing, Ron, before you continue. Many people have asked me personally, why do I stay with the IFOC or why do I even bother? I do it for the simple reason that I just like these guys. They've always been good to me. They get me into contests that I probably don't deserve to be in. That's one reason. The other reason is that, let's say I decided, hey, you know what? Screw these guys. I'm going to do something independent. Okay, so what? I'm going to make $100. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm going to see a great contest out there and say, shit, I can't get into this contest because I'm not in the organization anymore. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think that way. They, they live for the moment. It's good. I mean, you know, it, it just, it all depends on how much money you think you're going to make. If, if, you know, if you decide to say, uh, you know, I've had it with these guys. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to bolt out and try something else. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, you know, back in the days, uh, you know, Rich 
you know, I had a lot of fun. Right. Um, going to contests, you know, especially it was one contest that we, we both almost died laughing. It was a grilled cheese eating contest. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, our, our grilled cheese comes and our sandwiches are rock hard, you know, like stale bread and grilled cheese. I think I remember that. That's totally incredible, man. And, and Rich and I just totally, um, I, mean, I mean, we could have, we could have both had heart attacks at that point. We were laughing so hard. We were angry, but, you know, we just thought it was so hysterical when we saw this. Right. And, you know, and I, I was never a signed member of the IFOCE, but I liked the shade so much that I acted as if I was a signed member. If I was to do an eating contest outside of OCE, I always called the Shays to ask them if it was okay if, if I did that. If they said no, I wouldn't do it. Mm. All right? But, but what happened is uh, a few years back, um, there was an ice cream contest in California, I think Starrell, which was for Make-A-Wish Foundation. Right. And I called the Shays up, or called IFOC up, and... Um, I asked for permission, and they said um, they'd rather not, you know, um, they'd rather me not do this. And I said, it's for charity. I said, I always call to ask you for permission. Right. I have to do this. You know, so I went ahead and did it. From that time on, my relationship with them was never the same. This is why I'm not in the league anymore. Right. I I think they've probably softened their stance on the charity uh, situations now. Like, because um, I know I see a number of guys doing stuff that they probably shouldn't be doing. Um, but it's for charity, so I guess they've gotten away with it. And they're still eating, but uh, I think yeah. the same should have applied to you as well. You know. Well, you know, I, I'm not one of their premier eaters, nor you know have I ever been. I just like to go and compete, and like I say, the brotherhood. And you know what I'm talking. about. Right, right, yeah, definitely. Um, all right, so anyway, let's get a, let's get into a little bit about Rich Lefevre, El Toro. Uh, you just brought this to my attention that uh, if you don't mind that, that I mention it, um, that they actually called you. Yes. And I'm I'm really surprised about that because I'll let me just interrupt for a second. Um, that would never the situation that I'm that that I'm being blessed with on Eat Feats, a couple of these scumbags, they would never even ever think about going out of their way and calling me on the phone and trying to bury the hatchet. Not that I would anyway, because I've been called the most vile, vicious, lethal, disgusting, despicable names that no burying the hatchet or even a, a, a present delivered to my front door would make me ever want to speak to these people again. But anyway, let's hear about your situation. Well, um, Rich called me up on the phone. Mm -hmm. you know, he wanted to end this uh, so-called feud that we were having. Well, that was nice of me. Really a feud. I just didn't want anything to do with them anymore. Right. Um, but, you know, if he would ping me on eight feet, I'd ping him right back. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, things start to get a little crazy on there. Well, you can see it's, it's certainly it's uh, uh, it's the, it's been the children's hour for the last th for the last few months. If you notice that, right? You know what? The, all these anonymous people that go online. Now it's only two people, Ron. But I'm not going to get into that. Go ahead, continue. They got a big kick out of it. Yeah. They said it was the best thing going on in a long time on each. Exactly. What the what way? What they are doing is feeding into making e feats a very popular site. Which is why this person that runs it decided to take the Jerry Springer attitude mm -hmm. and say the hell with it. I'm going to let no holes barred and just let this shit go on and on and on. And people are going to keep flocking to the site. Well, so. basically, just to let you know, I banned myself from the site. Okay. After, um, you know, uh, the phone call with, with Rich, I said, I told him plain off, I said, I'm no longer on the site, nor will I read it. 
Okay, and that's, I think everyone should take that stance. Yeah, I said if there was a way for me to block that site from my computer, I would do it. Absolutely. Um, and, um, you know, and then we got nothing but a cancer. The phone call. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, you know, Rich is saying, you know, we, we go back a long time, we used to be buddies. What happened? Well, I'll say one thing, Ron, I just want to drop one thing. I will commend him for making a phone call. Yeah, no because problem. in this day, in this day and age... Everyone has been, this social media has killed our society yeah. with this texting. It's, a, it's, it's getting out of, it's ruined relationships. I could even tell you for a fact that it's ruined a, a family relationship with myself with this bullshit texting. Unbelievable. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's very commendable, but he made the call, but the call was a lie. Right. That, that was the funniest thing out of the whole thing, you know. We, we buried the hatchet, um, you know, we, we said, you know, maybe we'll go out to dinner. You know, my wife said, you know, maybe we'll go out to dinner. And uh, Rich uh, and I were talking about what, what basically it started. It's nothing that Rich did. It's just, I call it guilty by association. Okay. All right. And um, he's saying, well, I, I no longer hang out with this person, uh, we see him very little, and blah, 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 only to find out that that person happened to be in his house at the same time he made the call. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right? So Rich basically baited me a couple of questions here. Well, what, what started it? What, what do you think he said, and so on and so forth? And you know, Rich says, well, you know, that's one of the reasons we... we don't hang out anymore. We we see him every once in a while. And me, only to find out that later on, Rich, Colleen, and this person go out and do a contest together, uh, downtown Vegas in Prime Rib meeting. All right. Uh, now, let me let me let me say this. There were rumors that were circulating that, and you could you can you can tell me if they're true or not that. You were pissed off at Rich because um, <laughs> I don't even know if I should get into this because you, you'll, you'll probably say, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, that he, uh, that El Toro was sort of a son to you and then Lefevre moved right in and took your adopted son away uh, because you were actually the first one to spend time with him, you know, doing the eating challenges and stuff like that. Is there any truth to that, or? No truth to that, but I'll tell you something about El Toro. Right. right? Um, he was a good guy. He was a real, real good guy. We had a lot of fun together. We did some contests together. Uh, we did some videos together. All right? But then something changed. Yeah. And something changed for the worse, and which is, to me, so unforgivable. And this is why I say guilty by association. Right. Well, we won't get into that um, yeah. because I think we know we don't want to start pointing fingers or putting the blame and starting, you know, accusations that could lead, that could get ugly. But I will say this about El Toro. He was my right-hand man on the West Coast when I did my beautiful Brian's Corner show. And yeah. he provided a, one hell of a, a shot in the arm to the show itself. Um, uh, you know... It was like having Stuttering John from the Howard Stern show. Yeah. Uh, he, he did. Was talented and he was very funny when he did his stuff. Yeah, I mean, this guy could probably be making a million dollars a year or pro probably more doing stand-up comedy or uh, even, you know, I mean, he just has that natural ability. Um, yeah. And I think he knows it and everybody knows it. And even the Shays utilized his his yeah. talents uh, when they um, when you guys did the um, thing for Spike TV. But like everything else, you know, people utilize certain people's talents, and then they drop them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the story with uh, let's get back. So he was actually in Rich's house. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So Rich was just baiting me with questions and answers and hoping I would say, which I did. I told Rich, you know, what caused the whole thing. I mean, basically, El, El Toro hurt me pretty bad. He right. said something that's pretty bad. And what I say, there's no apology needed. I just mm. don't want nothing to do with him ever again. Right. Um, obviously, it must have had a profound effect on 
El Toro, if he was in the actually in Rich's house when you, Rich made the phone call to you. Yo, yeah, actually, it was, it was the setup. It was the setup all the way. Right. It's, it was well, basically what that girl did to John Sterling. Oh, jeez, I forgot all about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about the one that the girl that did that to Marv Albert? Oh, brother, you know. It's, <laughs> I wonder you know, if they taped the phone call. <laughs> yeah. I, I was a fool. Yeah. No, nah, you're not a fool, Ronnie. You, um, um, <laughs> they, they, they actually, you know, they made the attempt. They made the phone call. I don't, for what it's worth, uh, you know, like I, someone told me a long time ago, uh, people are responsible for their own actions. Um, an apology means nothing unless you see future you know, positive results after that apology. No. Anyone could say I'm sorry to anyone. You know, uh, I've, I've heard murderers uh, on trial say I'm sorry to the victims, the yeah, families, and what the hell good does that do? Is, he was a nice guy. Oh, yeah. I, I, and El Toro is to me what Gavone is to you. Yeah. He did the exact same thing. All right? Well, I think there's, a, there's sort of a fine line between... El Toro and Gavon. Gavon is uh, this guy's uh, probably a paranoid schizophrenic. I don't think El Toro was mentally disabled, um, so I guess no, one has an excuse and the other one. Well, I don't know. Yeah, he does things very calculating. Right. Well, I'm that. I'm sorry to hear because I was actually hoping that you guys would, at one time, stay real good. I, I was hoping that all you, all three of you, would become great friends and you'd hang out together. But I guess that's not going to happen. Then. No, it, w it will never happen again, ever. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, you know, I, I said to my wife, I said, if Rich and El Toro were in the contest, and I just won't say hello to any one of them. I'll sit at the end of the table. Well, I'll. I have to. I have to make a confession, Ron, that I had spoken to Mickey Sudo mm -hmm. a few weeks back and. Uh, we had been speaking about you just briefly, and uh, she had mentioned that, um, you know, she would not uh, be at all, uh, she would, wouldn't mind, you know, saying hello to you or maybe meeting for lunch or whatever. I'm, I'm sure you would be as receptive as anything on that, uh, in that yeah, regard. She's not done anything to me. Right. Well, I just thought the base, maybe because she was associating with Rich that it might cause some problems. But. No, it, it, that, it doesn't work that way. It works on what people do to me. Exactly. So it has nothing to do with who's associating with who. You're not going to hold some... You're not going to blame someone for associating with someone you don't like. Oh, no, 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 no. That don't, it doesn't work. I don't work Right. That. Yeah, I was sort of brought up in that, in that sense that... Um, I think my mom told me one time, uh, if you hate someone... Uh, don't hold it against the person that you're friends with if they decide to uh, latch on to that individual uh, because then it makes you even more uh, of a, a person. It, it makes you less of a person. Well, as, as you and I have something in common, we were born in Brooklyn. Yes. And that's the way we're taught. It's not like, you know, here in Vegas where everything is a performance. Exactly. Uh, living in Brooklyn all these years, um, I'm sure you go back to the 1960s when pizza was 20 cents a slice. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we didn't have to go to Manhattan to enjoy ourselves. We, although I was a little kid back then, so I would depend on my parents to take me around. Um, you know, I couldn't take a subway by myself at seven, eight years old. But you had everything in Brooklyn. Flatbush Avenue had everything. You had the best restaurants, and the only time you went to Manhattan was if you want to see a Broadway play, yeah. or if you wanted to see a first-run movie. If you, and that was really about it. You did have the, the outstanding restaurants in Manhattan, but you had everything in Brooklyn. Um, exactly. I mean, and you probably know a lot more than I do because you're a little older than I am. Yeah, Vegas is great. Or oh, do you remember the three for a dollar Nathan hot dogs? Oh man, I I missed that. Uh, there was the place on Forty Second. 43rd and 7th, I believe. Yeah. It looked like a 
it had about six floors to the building. It looked like a, a reconverted a savings bank mm -hmm. or a church. That's how big the place was. You had um, all the derelicts and the homeless people would hang out on the top floor and uh, have themselves a hot dog for, and sit there for about seven, eight hours. Yeah, but um. Now here in Vegas, it's eight ninety five for one hot dog. But Ron, I I have a very vague memory of Nathan's in Brooklyn, uh, the Nathan's famous, you know, the the big one where they hold the hot dog eating contest. Yeah. Uh, were the hot dogs as big as they advertised them as? I know I went there once. I don't remember as a little kid being going there a lot, but uh, I do remember the taste of the French fries was a taste you could never even. Fathom. Yeah, they, they can't be reproduced today. They don't, as a matter of fact. Um, everything is, you put it in the machine and it comes out. It's, it's not the way it used to be where they, they actually fried stuff and, and they would uh, fry the hot dogs and the hot dogs, you can snap them, they were so good. Right. The, the problem was that, you know, I, my parents were the type that when we went to Brighton Beach, they were. They didn't want to drag schlep themselves all the way over to Coney Island, yeah. because you had all these imitation Nathan's restaurants, which were almost just as good on the boardwalk. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so by the time you got to Nathan's, you had to you had to force yourself to hold to hold your nose because of that great aroma of all the French fries and hot dogs that they were selling before you actually got to Nathan's. There was competition like you wouldn't believe, right? Yeah, and the chicken chow mein sandwiches at Nathan's. Yeah, I was uh, a friend of mine worked at Nathan's, and he was telling me about that. Um, that uh, it was uh, he knew the owner's son, and uh, that was a uh, at one time a unionized job. I mean, you really had to have credentials to work there. Exactly. So. Not right? the same anymore, you know. It really isn't. Right. I mean, it's um, you know, again, and you remember the old days and. You know, the New York Mets and stuff like that. It just brings back a lot of good memories. I thought I'd share, like, a very short story with you on the Mets. Um, I actually became a Mets fan in 1968 when my dad actually was watching a Mets game in 67 and explained to me what the, base, what the game of baseball was all about. And then the next year they were looking at homes in Staten Island, um, and the brand-new homes back then went for about $50,000. And uh, we're... From that day on, um, so this, uh, there was one home we were looking at, which was so about three or four years old, and this kid is watching a Met game. I remember my dad saying, let's hope they win. So I always remember that phrase that he coined, and uh, then I started taking a real interest in the Mets and what that team was all. And in 68, that's when I became a full-fledged Met fan. Wow, that's great. And I think I must have been about eight years old at the time, and they had a really bad team. But I just love watching them. And it was got to a point where I'd actually cry and scream and throw tantrums if they lost. <laughs> and I know it sounds crazy. So I'm over. So I'm in a relative's house one time. And you had all the in-laws on my father's side and my mother's side and stuff like that. And the in-laws on my father's side, um, one of them happened to be, uh, you know, a big horse player and a gambler and everything. And the Mets were getting bombed. So I ran into the other room crying, screaming and crying and slamming the door, right? <laughs> so I distinctly remember my uncles telling my dad, or I think my, did he have any money on the game? He, that couldn't be possible, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, then he went in and closed the door and he spoke to me about it. And he said, you know, we know you, I, I know you like the Mets, and, but they're not going to win all the time. They're going to win and they're going to lose, so... You got to take the good with the bad, and then miraculously next year they won the the World Series, and I stopped crying. After that, I just stopped crying, man. Oh, unbelievable! <laughs> My first um, photo assignment with the New York Mets is when Willie Mays retired. Yeah, I think I I think I remember that back in '73. Yeah. Um, Willie was a hell of a guy. I mean, you could always get an autograph from him. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the last year was with the Mets. We would hang out after the game and wait about an hour and a half, and he'd show up, and 
lo and behold, he'd sign the autographs. Uh, Lindsey Nelson, Ralph Kiner, Bob Murphy, class guys. They would always have a big smile for you, and they'd no problem with an autograph. And that's those are the kind of people that you want to remember. Oh, absolutely. You remember Brooklyn, and you know I was too young to remember the Brooklyn Dodgers. I was probably not around when I was around, but um, that was probably even more of a the mom and pop home atmosphere. Oh yeah, it was great. The atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, Ron, let me let you go. Um, I'm glad you uh, set the record straight. Uh, and um, I, I think you still have a lot of eating. You know, one good thing about competitive eating is, you know, when a boxer has had it, like Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier and some of the other guys, the legends, the reflexes are gone. They just yeah. can't do it anymore. Uh, as long as you have a mouth and a tongue, you can eat, and God, God willing, you know, no intestinal diseases of any sort. You could put away food. You could eat until you're 80. Absolutely. Uh, Let me just say this much. Yeah. Remember I told you that Rich and Colleen and uh, El Toro went to um, eat the... Uh, yeah, the prime rib. Prime rib, all right? So Rich set a record over there. El Toro came in second, and um, Colleen came in third. So there is the top three. I was so angry mm -hmm. that I was set up by Rich that night. That the wow. Day I went there. Because I haven't, I don't do competitive eating that much anymore. But the very next day I went there and I beat his record by six minutes. Was, was that, was that a, was that a record that was actually documented on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I, I knew when, when I saw that posted, I knew. I said, Ron's not going to let that go, man. <laughs> no, I, I, because I was angry. And, you know, I, I found out something about me eating. If I eat when I'm angry, I do real good. Exactly. You know, and then and these people that come on, and they want to say, oh, well, Psy can only, he can only eat a one-pound burger. Well, hell, man, they didn't, they weren't knocking El Toro when he ate the one-pound burger. So it's basically, exactly. and you know what? When I went into that place and ate that one-pound burger, I didn't want any notoriety, attention, or anything. I wanted a, actually a bigger burger. All they had was the one pound, and I wasn't about to buy another one-pound burger in addition to the one I had if I'm not going to get that for free after I finish it. Exactly. So it was all about the time that I was going to set. It was a friendly bet between myself, a non-wager bet between myself and Tor that I would top his timing, and I did by like maybe five or six or maybe ten seconds, whatever. So it was all about setting a time on a one-pound burger. Anybody could eat a one-pound burger. Exactly. So, you know. But I, I'm, I'm glad that you did what you did. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you could probably put away a a 64 to 96 ounce prime rib beef. I don't know. I, you know, I won't try it. I really won't. Right. I'm, I want to end this with a little bit of a, another controversy, a little statement. Yeah, sure. I'm going to say to IFOC and all the major league eaters, do you think it's fair that all you guys and all you girls that go out and really kill yourself to try to qualify for Nathan hot dogs, right. only to find out that somebody qualified by eating nine? <laughs> yeah, that's... Do you think that's fair? That's, um... I guess that's a, that's a question we have to put up on topic for um, the uh, next podcast. Uh, but that's interesting, though. That's uh, that's uh, something that uh, a lot of people are going to wonder about. Um, but I, I, I do know this, that for the women, when they do reach, if they reach the finals, that's on their own dime. So they're not getting a free paid trip out there. I think they have to eat a minimum of like 12 or 13 hot dogs. Yeah, but, you know, shouldn't it be the same thing for the guys then? If a guy uh, eats under 20 but he qualifies, now they're saying, you know, a guy can only qualify if he eats 20. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Then. Is that the new rule? Yeah, that's the double standard. I know there were some issues with Brian Beard. Um, he was the last person to qualify under 20. 
Uh, that was a couple of years ago, and I think there was some problems with that. Um, but I got to look into that. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, Ron, it was a pleasure having you. I hope that this new podcast that I'm doing catches on. Um, I think it might because there are a lot of people that work long shifts and they're sitting at their their desk or table and they're bored out of their mind and hopefully this will kill some of that time as opposed to my old show which you had to actually watch it on a computer screen and uh, it was a lot of work and this is a lot less work so I just want to try to inform people or enlighten people about things that are going on in the sport and you know maybe we could talk about other topics as well but to have you as the initial guest on my show uh, was an honor for me and uh, so I hope you still hang in there in the competitive eating scene uh, whether it be with an organization or without I will I mean uh, you know it, I, I still got life left in this old body that's great Ron I'm glad to hear that and uh, glad you're keeping active and um, there's always uh, something to do in Vegas exactly I just want to mention that before we go I'll a co-worker of mine, um, he had complained that uh, he was in Vegas and he was totally, he was bored out of his mind. Um, and it, <clears throat> I just couldn't believe it. No, he did go by himself, but I'm like, there's always something to do there, whether it be an eating challenge or a restaurant or a show or, you cannot get bored in Vegas. Every hotel has an eating challenge. That's number one. Wow. Really? That, that wasn't like that a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, it upsets me a little bit also. I, I just got to add this in because it upsets yeah, sure. me also. Um, so many of the guys come into town that I used to compete with. They come into town. I don't even get a call. I don't get an email. Oh, Ron, I totally wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Some of them are really just goddamn selfish or... It's just, you know, antisocial, horrible. I don't know, but you know what? It's, it's, I'm not jealous of Rich Lefebvre or anything. Yeah. That has nothing to do with it. But, but the party is always at his house. The party is always at his house. But I'm the guy that can get you into any damn show in town. Exactly. I'm the guy that if you go to a buffet, you don't have to wait online for. You know what I'm saying? And yet, you know what I say? No second chance. Absolutely. Don't call me. Don't want to know you. Come into town. You're on your own. I know. I could mention, without mentioning names, I could I could think of just a few off the top of my head yeah. that came out here, and they were we were practically in the same backyard, and they didn't even want to exactly. call, know me, email me, or anything. That's low class. Uh, just, you know... That's basically upbringing right there. I mean, you just, you know, you want to be that way, fine. But actually, I agree with you on that 100%. I don't want to know these people either. Yeah. And they don't get a second chance as well. No, no. If you ever come out, you won't believe what, what you can say. That's all I, I know if I come out there, I guarantee I'm going to spend some time with you. You're going to be the first one I'm going to pick up the phone and make a phone call to. We'll get some shows, and you won't believe the shows we can get into. Oh, fantastic. And, uh... Thanks a lot, Ron. Thanks for being the guest right, on, so much. on Beautiful Brian's podcast, and uh, we will uh, hopefully see you soon in the near future.